Now here's your host, the Bronx Journal's Editor-in-Chief, Professor Miguel Perez. Latinos have certainly come a long way in the film industry for decades. They were only allowed to participate in small roles that were often, often portraying Latinos in negative light. Uh, today, Latinos can be seen almost everywhere, working as actors, producers, even film directors. Our guest tonight has done it all. He's the winner of numerous awards, community awards, and film awards. He's also the boor a board member of the National Association of Independent Latino Producers, and he's the co-founder of Latino Artists Collective here in New York City. Edwin Pagan, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure having you here. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're going to talk about all of these organizations that you belong to. We're going to talk a little bit about the Latinos in the film industry, but we want to start with the latest. What's news about you? And that is this documentary that you're working on that really relates to the Bronx, Bronx Burning. Tell me about that. Well, Bronx Burning is, is my current signature project, and um, it, 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 it chronicles what happened in the 60s and 70s when the borough was basically being torched to the ground for profit. Um, what was going on, the city was in a crisis, a fiscal crisis. Uh, there was a large, uh, what was going on was white flight. People were moving to the suburbs. The community was basically at that point becoming mostly African American and Latino. Um, Puerto Ricans coming over from the island, uh, poor uh, African Americans coming up from the south. And uh, basically we were the only ones coming into the borough while everyone who was here from previous generations was moving out. And the landlords thought that they weren't going to be able to make a profit on their uh, businesses, on their buildings with rent and, and, and selling buildings, so forth. So they decided that a quick way to do it was to torch the buildings and collect on the insurance. So and they burned their own property. They burned the buildings for the insurance, their own tenements. And th the way they did it most often was that they would hire someone from the community to torch the building and then they would collect on the insurance. Mm -hmm. so Did they put people's lives at risk uh, when they were doing this? Obviously when you're burning down a building, there are tenants there. Uh, when did they do this that, you know, uh, did they actually kill people in the process? Well, people, people did get hurt uh, on many occasions, but for the most part, uh, it was common knowledge that it was occurring after a point and the technique was most often that the landlords would even give the keys to whoever was going to set fire to the building. So they would come in the evening they would come down through the staircases, go into one of the apartments that had already been vacated on the top floors, and they would, you know, pour the whatever uh, flammatory but, material but and set it. Uh, set I, it I was around when this was happening, and and for people who were not, I, I I need you to explain this to them. How is it possible? Where was law enforcement at that time? Uh, you know, the, 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 the mayor. Where, where, why wasn't this stopped when everyone knew that the Bronx was burning? Why wasn't it stopped? And what, what about the insurance companies? What were they saying? Well, the insurance companies weren't saying anything. They were in cahoots with the landlords because it came uh, kind, of, kind of a cottage industry. And you got to think back at what was going on in the city in those days. As I said before, it was, the city was in a crisis, so there was more to think about than what was happening in the Bronx to poor people. Mm -hmm. People had bigger fish to fry. People were looking for their own interests. And the politicians knew that we weren't the ones that were voting. So they really weren't interested of what was happening to people of color in the South Bronx. We were poor. We weren't voting in the way that we do now. So of course they wrote us off. And I notice that you keep saying we. We, uh, because this is very personal to you. You grew up in the South Bronx. Well, I, I grew up in the South Bronx. I lived on 174th and Southern Boulevard, very close to Charlotte Street, where if you remember, Carter's came at one point. Sure. And is, it, it's the first time that it really became it got into the Amer American psyche because the, the news covered it. And for the first time in, in American television, people knew that this place called the South Bronx existed. And it also, they saw for the first time the, the horrible conditions that had already permeated the community. Because by the time Carter came, it had already been a decade of an ongoing uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. And what are you uh, hoping to do with this documentary? And you're still working on it, right? It's not still finished. Still working on it. Yeah, we just, uh, we've been in production for about six months now. We went through a long period of R&D to make sure that we had the research correct mm -hmm. and that we could identify the people that we're going to interview. And we're in production now. We should be in production for another six months before we go into post. But the, 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 the prime uh, reason to doing the documentary is to set the record straight. Because one of the things that you know on, uh, around the world is that if you mention the South Bronx, mm -hmm. people think of it as a, as, as image, a problem, yeah. image problem. They, they consider it a wasteland where nothing but 
poor people. And in many cases, even when you look at some of the archival footage of people being interviewed in that time, they kept referring to us as animals because they thought that we were just, we were the ones that destroyed the community. And I want to set the record straight because I think one of the things on top of the fact that we were already a disenfranchised community, we, we also were victimized by getting the stigma mm -hmm. of having committed the crimes, mm -hmm. and which for the most part was a white collar crime. So uh, when you finish this documentary, what do you, who, who do you want to see this? Who, who is your audience? Well, part of the documentary is funded by uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, so it's obviously going to go on public television. So PBS will have PBS it. PBS will have it. Um, uh, definitely we are in, in talks with uh, Independent Lens, we're in, uh, with POV, American Documentary. And during last year's Tribeca All Access, uh, we met with a lot of distributors who come and meet with people during that time. And there's an in interest from the commercial sector too. But they get involved at the point where it, it, it's open for distribution. And when you, when you say you're in the process of production right mm -hmm. now, explain to people what that means. Exactly what are you doing? You're out shooting? You're interviewing? Well, who are you talking to for this documentary? Well, we're interviewing people from the community. We're, in we're interviewing politicians. We're interviewing people that live through it community uh, groups that help s turn the tide. We're speaking to people that were in law enforcement, fire department, um, people that were part of the city who at that time were trying to make a difference. And those are the people that are going to bring out. So there's a lot of interviews there, eyewitness interviews for people who saw this, experienced this. First hand. Mm -hmm. And we have a clip, so let's watch a clip. I think we're ready. Uh, well, w the work in progress that uh, Edwin is doing. Let's watch this. The owners couldn't make money off the real estate investments that they had. They were in real estate to make money, not to service people. So then they started holding back services. Uh, and finding ways to make money on their investments. Uh, that turned into a very hideous and insidious situation in the South Bronx, which eventually was the model that was replicated all over the country. Uh, the owners of the property began to milk the properties. They didn't provide services. They just took all the rents. They didn't provide any kind of maintenance. They kept paying the insurance. And eventually they would have the buildings burned to the ground because they will, they, will have already, they will have already made their money from the rents, they get money from the insurance, they didn't pay taxes, and at the end of the day, the city of New York in those days does not hold you accountable. If you owe taxes, you lose the building, you didn't have to pay for it. So they would lose a, a hulk of a building, but the insurance companies would pay them mightily. And then came that period, the gang started to come in, and they started threatening people. And even though we knew a lot of the javelins, they were at war with the turbans. So that means that anybody that knew them was in danger. And because of that, people needed to flee. And because some of the gangs in the building next to mine, there was a gang called the Seven Crowns. Eventually, they took over the whole building. So that when there was a fight and they fought in an area away from here, they come and run back into the building. And that brought the danger to us. I'll tell you a true story. We lived at 555 Caldwell Avenue, and um, it was one of the old buildings standing up, you know, burnt out buildings around it. And on a weekly basis, you know, apartments were being burned. And, you know, my mother one day opened up the fire escape and told the fireman, you know, what's your name? I'm seeing you here once a week. Would you like some bangi cafe? But that, that was sort of like wildfires up there. And, you know, I think some of the famous cases that we know of, and there was uh, a couple of very uh, important articles that were written in the Village Voice called The Men Who Were Burning New York, and they grew out of some of those fires in the Bronx, and where they connected all, you know, a whole ring of guys who were, um, you know, whether it was the landlord or the middleman or the insurance broker or you know, the kid on the street who they paid 50 bucks to do it, they were all sort of involved to, together. <laughs> 